All right, there we go. Hello everyone, how's it going? Team here and this is BXJS Weekly episode 42, Christmas edition. First of all, Merry Christmas to all of you who celebrate and happy holidays to whoever doesn't or celebrate something different, you know, uh, wherever you live. And uh, yeah, we got some news today. Uh, hey Bakao, welcome to the stream. As you might imagine, this is pretty much a Christmas slash New Year week. So um, yeah, there's not that much stuff going on, but Amusingly enough, we have a lot of releases this week around, um, even though, you know, there was this joke about please don't release anything before Christmas, which is actually a sane device, but uh, for some reason people think that it's okay to release quite a lot of pretty major releases actually, but um, hey. But uh, yeah, let's get cracking with the news, shall we? The first article we got today here is called Let's Talk JavaScript Documentation, and it's essentially a collection or I guess a survey or overview of a set of tools that you can use to document your code. Some of them I've never heard, the others I've used myself and they are quite good. Uh, but overall, you know, if you're looking to generate a documentation for your project and you are wondering which tool to use and what are available on the market essentially, do check this out. It is a very good summary. Uh, hey, Kevin, welcome to the stream. Uh, I personally can recommend Gitbook. This was a very positive experience. We used it in a couple of projects and uh, on the generator side, I can recommend the ESDoc, which worked quite nice for me. I actually picked it over JSDoc, which is the, I think the oldest project because at the moment it didn't support any ES syntax, which was like a bit iffy for me, but yeah. Yeah, so if you're looking for documentation tool for your codes, do check this article out. It has a very nice summary of pretty much everything available right now. And um, yeah, those projects are quite good. All right, next article we got here is synchronizing async operations in JavaScript. And uh, it's basically about mutexes. And uh, can I just like before we get to the article, can I just uh, present you my tiny nitpick that infuriates me to no end? Whenever I see the article that has the title in the image, like I want to murder someone when this happens because I cannot copy this. Like I have to go into the view source and then find it in the title and copy it from there. I don't know why people do this. It's like, but whatever. Let's go to, back to the article. So this is essentially a tutorial on the mutexes. Uh, if you ever worked with um, asynchronous languages uh, that basically have to do a bunch of things together, like I think Java has, for example, mutexes by default and C Sharp has mutexes by default. There is no mutex in JavaScript, but to be honest, I don't think I ever had any use cases where I would need one. I mean, again, it might be my, uh, you know, my cases and my code, which were always kind of working most of the time in parallel. So I guess that was uh, by design most of the time. But uh, sometimes there are cases when you actually need a mutex and you need to lock something until the other actions finish, right? Uh, and this article exactly talks about that, about creating a mutex, a synchronous mutex that you can acquire and release which would mean that any time that other operation tries to acquire the mutex, it will wait for the old one to release, which is a very straightforward idea, to be honest, and works really well with async await. So if you're curious about the pattern, do check it out. The article is quite good. All right, next article we got here is linked lists in the wild, React hooks. This is a follow-up uh, essentially to this uh, really cool article that we talked about, I think, last time. Thank you, next, an introduction to linked lists. And it talks about the application of linked lists in the wild and specifically in React hooks. Turns out the React hooks were actually built on top of linked lists, which is something I didn't know. But I mean, I never actually looked in the uh, source code for whatever reasons. I get <laughs> lack of time, I guess, pre predominantly, but hey. So it turns out the React hooks are built on top of linked lists. And this article walks you through the code of the hooks that basically step by step explains what what exactly is happening and how exactly are linked lists used to create the react hooks, which is really neat. So if you're interested in either react hooks or linked lists application in real world, do check this article out, it is quite good. Right, next one we got here is really cool. Uh, standalone WebAssembly VM benchmark. So WebAssembly has been out for quite some time. And uh, not just in the Chrome or Edge or you know any other browser, but also there's been a lot of people who were building um, WebAssembly virtual machines, like standalone ones that you can either embed somewhere or just run code 
wherever you want with it, right? So there's a bunch of them, including VAVM, Assemble, Vasmer, Vesmi, Ves Vagan, and like, I don't remember, I think there's like a ton of them. So this article essentially goes to test how exactly they perform. It's worth noting that there are two types of uh, Vasm VMs available right now. One of them are compilers like VAVM, Assemble and Vasmer. As you can see here, they perform significantly better than the counterparts, which are interpreters, which basically interpret the code and act on them as if it were a script, right? And as you can see, obviously the performance difference is quite huge here. But it nonetheless is quite interesting to see the um, performance of um, those VMs in the wild on, well, you know, typical benchmarking tasks like uh, compression and deflation and factorization, Fibonacci and all that kind of stuff. The performance is actually really good. Like this is a surprising numbers that I did not expect from uh, projects that are that young because majority of those uh, WebAssembly VMs was started like in this year, basically, right? So kind of crazy. But uh, yeah, if you're interested in WebAssembly and standalone VMs, do check it out. So some pretty interesting insights over here. All right, next thing we got here is build and test sliders with React hooks. How to build a slider to change the size of a ball and then test it with React testing library. So this is a more hands-on tutorial with uh, working with hooks and uh, most importantly, testing your hooks, which is very neat. So the idea of the demo is very simple. You were gonna build this thing shown on a demo, which is essentially includes a slider, which you can drag left and right that changes the size of a ball rendered above it. That's basically it. So it's a very straightforward thing. Uh, but uh, there's a bunch of related things that you have to consider when building that, including, uh, you know, rendering the, changing the stuff, changing the state, again, using the hooks. It's not that complicated, but if you never use them, you will have some, um, how to say, you will, you will be a bit confused at first. Let's just put it this way. Especially if you're new to functional programming, it might be even more confusing, but hooks are awesome. They're definitely worth learning. And uh, if you want to get into them, and especially if you want to learn how to test them properly, which is a pretty large chunk of this article, essentially, do check this out. This will get you started in no time and it is quite good. All right. Next article we got here is once again about WebAssembly. It's called WebAssembly is Fast, a real world benchmark of WebAssembly versus ES6. And uh, well, the title is a bit clickbaity to be honest, but it's not far from the reality. So this is the article from Aaron Turner, who is uh, one of the maintainers of, um, I think the name of it was uh, WebAssembly Boy, Vasm Boy, there we go. So it's a Game Boy, Game Boy Color emulator built in WebAssembly. And uh, when he says that it's a real world benchmark, what he really means is that it's a real world benchmark using the Game Boy emulator and a bunch of different browsers and hardware, which is still very neat and very interesting, but obviously caveats apply. And, uh, you know, to give him credit, he does mentions all of those in the article. So it's just a title that is a bit clickbaity. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the article basically benchmarks the uh, Game Boy emulator written in WebAssembly on a bunch of different systems, including uh, MacBook Pro, iPhone 6S, iPhone X, Google Pixel 2, Moto G5 Plus, and Toshiba Chromebook, which is probably the lowest power device here, I guess. I'm, I'm, I'm actually curious what is the lower power Moto G5 or Chromebook. That would be interesting. Probably Chromebook actually at this point. <laughs> I think Moto G5 is quite quite a new phone, right? But yeah, so the browsers tested were Chrome 70, Firefox 63, Safari 12.1, and he didn't test Edge because Edge will be basically replacing the engine with Chromium based browsers. So why the hell would you test the current version anyway? The results are well interesting. So if when you look at the more powerful platforms like, uh, for example, Chrome running on MacBook, the VASM is just, you know, 1.67 times faster, just a bit faster. Um, Firefox, uh, I'm not sure, there seems to be some sort of a bug because the WebAssembly is 11 times faster and Clojure Compiler is like six times faster, which is crazy, but there are links to the bug and issue here, which I guess are relevant to this slowdown which is probably something JavaScript related, which is still interesting nonetheless. Safari shows more or less the same performance as the Chrome does. So 1.35 times uh, WebAssembly is a bit faster, like 30%. 
Mobile, on the other hand, this is where things get really interesting. So on mobiles, depending on the hardware and software of device, you see some very significant improvements like on uh, Moto G5 Plus with Chrome, the WebAssembly is 2.6, almost 2.6 times faster, which is kind of incredible when you think about it. Uh, if the device is more powerful, like for example, iPhone 6S, the WebAssembly does not give as much performance. So it's just 1.23% times faster, which is still impressive, but you know, not as significant as on the older devices, uh, which is crazy. So yeah, if you are interested in WebAssembly applications and the difference in speeds and all the caveats related to the benchmarking, actually do check the article out. It is quite cool. Right, continuing, we got a pretty lengthy article called JavaScript Getter Setter Pyramid from uh, Mr. Andre Stalz, uh, or I guess Stalz, I'm not, like I'm always trying to read it in German way, but I don't think that's the correct way. <laughs> so apologies in advance to Mr. Uh, Stalz. Uh, but yeah, this is basically an article that summarizes the abstractions such as promises, iterables, observables, and all the others in conjunction with the functions and values in JavaScript. He uh, created a very interesting way of presenting those building on top of, you know, first you have the values, then you have the functions. And then on top of that, you get uh, things like getter, setters, getter, getter, setter, setter. And then you get uh, iterables, then you get promises, then you get um, observables. And on top of all of that, we have the async iterable that has just recently been introduced uh, to the uh, language basically. And again, you know, this is a very, um, how to say, entry level article, let's put it this way, there's still a lot of very interesting thoughts here. But if you already understand all of those things, you won't really find anything new here. Uh, but if you are confused about any of those things, I mean, some terminology might be new to you. But you know, if you know what getter and setter are, and what iterable promises and observables are, you will know what the getter getter and setter setter are immediately like there's nothing super complicated about that. But if you're confused about those, uh, this article will clean up a lot of things for you. It's very well written, very easy to understand. And yes, Andre indeed has very good ideas and very good at explaining them majority of time. All right, continuing, we got NPM package permissions, an idea. So this is um, an attempt to tackle the NPM security issues and attempt to figure out a way to make NPM more secure because you know, we had the event stream, we had a bunch of other things. And uh, there's some inherent problems to the current package design, right? So um, this article tries to come up with a solution or actually comes up with a solution by uh, giving permissions. So where do you have permissions in browser, right? Whenever you open a website, and it tries to use your microphone, your browser will ask you, do you actually allow this browser to use microphone? So the author's suggestion is to do the same to packages. As in when you publish a package, it can specify the permissions it needs in the package JSON. Like for example, you know, you need network and you need HTTP and FS from Node.js site. Um, again, I'm not sure the point, there's a point in specifying the browser permissions because browser already has permission control, but doing this for Node.js actually sounds very interesting. For example, as the example, he says, hey, we have this fancy logger package, does it really needs access to node HTTP module or, you know, file system module? Well, file system, maybe if it writes the logs to the file, but not HTTP module, right? Unless it wants to communicate to some uh, elk stack or whatever. But I mean, it's, it's up to you, obviously, but the, you get the idea, right? So I think it's a really cool um, idea, because essentially, it allows you to quite effectively control the updates. Because once someone publishes malicious code that for example, tries to access file system, you will see these changes in the permission, right? And you you can react accordingly. Considering the module doesn't really work yet with this permission already, which is a completely different problem. But um, yeah, it's it's an interesting additional uh, layer of precautions, let's call it this way that could help fix a bunch of things. And uh, the author goes as far as to offer optional ways to enforce permissions in Node.js, having, you know, baked it in in the node itself or having baked it as a separate NPM package, which I think while it would work, so you could just, you know, throw that stuff into VM, 
Uh, the problem with this is that will, it will definitely add additional overheads, which would uh, result in slower code execution. So I don't know if you want to do that. But uh, yeah, in browser, like I'm, I'm not sure what's the point in doing it in browser. We already have that. Um, I mean, doing as fine grained as having control over fetch, WebRTC, and all that kind of stuff sounds a bit strange. It's like we we already running that in browser anyway. So you know, as long as the sandbox is fine and and you cannot access other domains information, we should be okay. So it's not like the browser can steal your bitcoins from your hard drive right now, right? We have the file system API coming, but uh, again, they require ex explicit prompts that users should approve. So I'm not convinced on this side, but the node side sounds very interesting. So if you're interested in the whole area of making NPM more secure, do check this article out. It is pretty interesting. Right, continuing, we got on Happy licensing of review. So this is uh, from the developer of Happy. They are also changing the license uh, pretty much to what we saw. I think it was Koa like a few months ago. They uh, announced that basically the latest release will also stay, will always stay basically the way it is now. But if you are on a legacy version and if you want uh, maintenance updates that fix the bugs and do stuff like this, you have to pay, which sounds absolutely fair, you know. If you're in a legacy version and you want maintenance, you have to pay for that. And if you are just using later release, then whatever. Um, so it looks like more and more open source projects are moving towards this sort of licensing, which is on one hand kind of great. On the other hand, I, I mean, I guess it was expected because we do need some way to maintain the open source uh, and the current model is just, you know, unsustainable, right? Because unless you're working for Facebook that literally pays you to work on React, you cannot really or to be honest, any other company that pays you to work on open source projects, right? There's no way, not no really a proper way to sustain your work unless you are a very public person that has a big following, like for example, Andre Staltz, or uh, I don't know, there was the the guy, uh, I'm almost forgetting his name, the guy who did the standard JS um, and a bunch of other people who are basically widely known, right? They have the Patreons that kind of feed them uh, in, in an acceptable manner, let's put it this way. But unless you have a few thousand people following you around, so even more than that probably, then you can't really sustain yourself uh, through open source, which is a bit sad. And I think we will see a huge shift here in the future. But um, yeah, let's see how that develops. All right. Um, yeah, I think that's basically it for the news and articles this time around. Now we got a bunch of uh, minor news, interesting things, and uh, all the cool, awesome, neat tidbits. First one of them is actually a new proposal to TC39 and it's a standard library proposal, which is probably the most exciting thing I've seen uh, for the JavaScript language in a while. It's already stage one, which is even more impressive. And uh, the idea is that the TC39 wants to extend JavaScript standard library so that people don't have to rely on a billion of modules uh, that can basically break, that can uh, become malicious, that can be removed from NPM, like, you know, pad, left pad. Um, and uh, yeah, I really support this idea. It's really cool. And uh, for now, again, it's stage one. So it's very early stage. Uh, there is proposals on how the semantics would work. It looks like it's only going to be for ES modules, uh, or at least for now, the syntax is only proposed for the ES modules. Um, it looks like we're going to get something like STD built-ins or STD date or STD whatever, which seems perfectly fine. And then you would get the default functions like, for example, length map and a bunch of others. There is already a ton of discussion going on. And uh, I am really interested to see how this will end up because, you know, getting better standard library is great. Uh, I think one of the one of the things when I started learning Golang, for example, one of the things that really uh, got me from the very beginning was the uh, just the I forgot the, the word. <laughs> just how impressive the standard library of Golang was. It was really cool. I don't think it includes new things in the libs, just what's already in it. Uh, uh, yeah, standard line. No, but like this, the, the whole, this, the proposal, right? This proposal describes adding a standard library to JavaScript that holds a set of APIs that can be used at runtime. So that's the, exactly the idea. Include new things 
that basically can be used anywhere as a standard library without people relying on things. Like for example, you don't really have a unified way of getting length and mapping over array set and map right now. This is exactly what it proposes. It's a generic way of getting length of all of those iterables and generic way of mapping over those iterables. So I think I am getting this correctly, right? So because uh, there's the benefits like availability, standardization, extensibility, fallback, speed, and all of that makes perfect sense. So I think they are literally gonna add standard library with new things that are more generic, like left pad. And maybe we see Lodash transformed into the JavaScript standard library. That would be freaking awesome, to be honest. But yeah, this is quite exciting. So I'm uh, really eager to see where all of that leads. All right, continuing, we got uh, ECMAScript modules and Node.js, the new plan. This is an article uh, that basically outlines how the modules, ES modules will work in Node.js and how is the mode, uh, God damn it, Node.js uh, team gonna proceed with their implementation and inter what's gonna happen to interop and interoperability phases and all that kind of stuff. So if you are curious about how the ESM is gonna work in Node.js and what is the timeline and what is the plan for it, do check it out. I mean, I already covered a bunch of those things in the previous episodes, but basically there's a very nice summary in a couple of pages. So if you're curious, do check it out. Uh, let me just have a look at the chat. It's just the base. We'll probably have more later that extra things. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's gonna be way more extended than this, but I, the, even the fact that they've decided to add this as a proposal to the core language is awesome. And even if they deliver a very tiny standard library in the beginning, and start expanding it later on, this is gonna be great. Like I, I already can see a bright future for, for JavaScript standard library. <laughs> All right, next uh, real, uh, real, next tiny thing we got here is TensorFlow.js, real-time object detection in 10 lines of code. This is a very tiny tutorial for uh, Coco SSD TensorFlow model that is, uh, I, I'm not sure if it's official or not, but at least it's located in the official TFJS models repository. This is a model for um, TensorFlow.js uh, image recognition, object recognition and images. And turns out you can now do that in like 10 lines of code with Canvas, which is damned impressive. And you can even tap into the user media and do the recognition in real time from the video, which is even more impressive. So if you ever wanted to give it a shot, uh, take a look at this tutorial. It is very short and very nice. And uh, man, TensorFlow.js is impressive as hell, to be honest. But yeah, there you go. Okay, next thing we got here is the tip from Mr. Vesboss on Intersection Observer. It is quite handy to use it when you need to disable UI and team south about, let me try that again, until something has been shown on the screen. For example, if user needs to read the whole terms of service and the accept button needs to be enabled just after that, there's a little snippet of code that basically allows you to do that. Uh, I've never actually used Intersection Observer so far, but it seems like a very neat uh, thingy. So, uh, you know, if you're doing anything like that, do check it out, it is pretty neat. Next thing we got here is how to worry about NPM package weight. And it's a neat overview of a tools that can allow you to track NPM package size. And uh, yeah, figure out, you know, what kind of things do you wanna use or uh, maybe wanna skip or find alternatives for. Um, yeah, it's, there's nothing new really here, at least for me, I've seen a lot of those already, but they are all good tools. So if you are, if you care about your bundle browser, uh, bundle browser, bundle size, do check it out. It's a very nice collection of tools. I think I've been using bundle phobia for quite some time for checking, you know, if I really want to pull that thing into my, uh, package or not. But yeah. Okay. Continuing. We got jest this this pr just landed into jest and uh, jest now supports typescript by default so if you're writing typescript you no longer need to configure anything you can just use jest and it will work with your typescript code base out of the box thanks to the babel 7 which is freaking awesome so yeah typescript is basically taking over the world and it's kind of great Next thing we got here is future of CSS color scheme. This is an overview of the new property prefer color scheme. This is a CSS media feature, not property actually, that allows you to detect the user preferences of his color scheme, something that has became, uh, you know, 
quite widespread recently. We already have it on mobiles, we have it on Mac OS, we now have it on Windows, and we now can have it in the browser as well. So you can actually uh, detect the user preferred color scheme and change your uh, website style depending on it. Still like a lot of work in progress, so this is still not stable and I don't think it's supported by all the browser, but it's a really neat tiny thing, so do check it out. All right, the last thing I got here is the Stop Learning Frameworks article that I think should be called Stop Learning Just Frameworks, which is a more precise title. And it talks about that learning uh, design patterns is way more important than learning frameworks because frameworks change while design patterns are pretty much the same for the last 40, 50, whatever, you know, from, from more or less from the very beginning of the software development. So if you are still learning frameworks, try learning software development or software design patterns. And there's a bunch of really good books actually that you should at least try to read. I mean, not all of them are, um, that's how do I put it? So if you already know things that our books are about, you won't really find anything new in them, right? Which is kind of expected. But if you are new to development, software development and new to design patterns, those books are really, really good and can help you a lot. Uh, but yeah, okay. Now we are coming to the releases section. Um, as I said, we have surprisingly lots of them before Christmas, which is on one hand awesome, on the other hand terrifying. Uh, first release of the week is V8 version 7.2. That is, we already talked about it. So it's 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 adding again performance improvements for a bunch of things. It's adding a sync stack traces, which is awesome. So it's actually going to get way better a sync um, stack traces. They're going to be way easier to read. We also got the public class fields without the flags enabled. So I cannot wait for this to land in the Node.js got intel.list format and a well-formed JSON stringify as well is a name module namespace exports as in you can export star as whatever from other file which now works without any babel or anything like that which is kind of awesome so yeah pretty major release pretty awesome stuff can't wait for it to land in the node.js but if you are interested you can try it right now because chrome version 72 beta has been released with all of those features and a bunch of others enabled. So if you are uh, willing to try out the beta version, just go ahead, jump on it. And uh, now you can just use public class fields right in your browser, which is kind of great. Next release we got here is another really big one, Electron version 4.0. This is seems to be predominantly released to uh, upgrade the Chromium to version 69 and Node to version 10.11 which um, honestly is like, it's great that they are upgrading it, but man, is it still lagging behind quite significantly? So it's like two versions behind the uh, V8 and Chromium. And um, I don't know, this Note 10, I think, is Note, Note 10, 11 is the latest LTS? Note LTS, we, let me just check, I'm curious. Is that the latest one? No, 10, 14 was the latest one here over here. I can see it, nope, uh, come on, where's my downloads? 10.14, yeah. So it's also lagging behind in the node part, which is kind of curious. I'm, I'm curious what kind of challenges do they have in integrating it. But I mean, anyway, you know, newer version of Chrome, newer version of Node, newer version of Node.js means more speed, less memory consumption and better performance. So it's kind of great. There's also some minor uh, API changes, uh, breaking ones, obviously. That's why it's version 4.0. So if you are using Electron for desktop apps, make sure to check all those changes and adjust your code to them uh, so that it doesn't actually break it. But yeah, pretty cool. Uh, next release we got here is Ava version 1.0, which is a very nice test runner. I've personally never used it, but I heard really good things about it. It also got npm init Ava that also installs everything for you if you want it. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, check it out. I never used it, but I heard really good things about it. Uh, let me have a look at the chats. How is it with Carlo? What was the Carlo thing? Um, oh yeah, it was the Chrome Labs thing. I don't, I don't actually know. I mean, they released the, it's still not stable. So I would not use it for productions apps just yet, but I'm curious to see how that will develop. Um, I still think that Electron is more ubiquitous, right? Because it just have everything shipped like all in one package. So you can just package it and distribute it. While Carlo relies on pre-installed Chrome, which I guess, you know, majority of people do have, but not all. So it's kind of, we'll see how that develops. I mean, it's, I would wait at least for version 1.0 release before using it, but yeah. All right, next release we got here is React version 16.7 
with a tagline, no, this is not the one with hooks. And they actually released a bug fix as a minor release uh, because of some uh, potentially breaking changes that could, uh, you know, destroy someone else's code base. So they released it as a minor to be sure so that people actually check the changes and make sure that nothing breaks. But yeah, the hooks are coming very soon according to this article as well. So I'm quite excited about that. I guess the hooks are gonna be 16.8. We're gonna see how all of that works out, but yes. So if you're using React, make sure to update. There are some bug fixes included. Next release we got here is a rollup version 0.68. If you never used Rollup, it's a really awesome bundler for libraries. So you can obviously use it for other purposes, but it works amazingly well for libraries and produces super tiny bundles. Uh, and it just really got a pretty major release. So it's been zero point whatever for ages. It is very stable, very good. And uh, 0.68 brings even more features. And yeah, the change list is insane. So if you, yeah, Rollup is great, so check it out if you need to build libraries. And it's an ES module bundler and it has a tree shake and all those kind of things that you expect from a module bundler. All right, next thing we got here is a Quick Link version 1.0. I uh, think I talked about Quick Link last week. It was just released then and it was like version 0 0.1 or something. And now we got version 1.0 that is basically get more features like controlling domains you can prefetch specifying a custom links, um, custom list of allowed origins and a bunch of other things. So, and it's just 782 bytes, which is kind of great. So do check it out. Next release we got here is parcel version 111, which adds zero config Kotlin support, which is crazy. Uh, hot module reloading for Ermlang, um, El Ermlang, Elmlang, uh, host option for uh, command line, Tree shaking improvements, extracting for workers, loggers, watchers into separate packages. So this is, I think, basically the movement towards the uh, parcel version two, which is supposed to be smaller, faster, and better. And uh, lots of bug fixes and improvements, as you might imagine. So it is kind of awesome. Parcel is great. I'm loving it and I can't wait to see the version 2.0. Next thing we got here is Node.js version 11.5 with a bunch of tiny changes, essentially, mostly bug fixes and doc changes. So nothing really major over here, but uh, make sure to update to it if you are living on the edge anyway. But yeah. All right, next thing we got here is Webpack 5 Alpha, right, pre-Christmas release. So Webpack guys decided to release the alpha version of Webpack. And if you are willing to test it and give them feedback, then, uh, you know, feel free to do that right now. You can install it with Webpack uh, at next and uh, just, yeah, try it out and uh, tell them if it breaks anything for you. So do check it out. Quite interested to see what kind of things we're gonna get with Webpack 5, but I'm guessing there's gonna be already in January because nobody really works on the Christmas, right? Or I hope so at least. All right. Next thing we got here is uh, libraries and demo section. So we got a bunch of new things that I have not encountered before. I'm not sure if all of them are that new, but hey, we got some stuff. So the first library we got here is a sync ray. Uh, it provides a sync await callbacks for every find filter, uh, basically all the array methods that you can uh, use for iteration. It introduces the asynchronous version of it that are in executed sequentially, as in, you know, if you do, for example, each and every or for each or whatever, it will be all run in parallel, right? Uh, even if you do a sync operation. So this one introduces the methods that essentially run uh, sequentially. So until first for each method, first for each call finishes, the next one won't start. Very straightforward. I mean, it's not really hard to do this yourself, but it's nice to have a library that basically simplifies this for you. So if you were looking for something like this, do check it out. Next thing we got here is concurrent tasks. Uh, that's literally how the library talks, uh, called. And it's a simple task runner that can run tasks concurrently while maintaining the limits. So essentially you can specify a bunch of tasks and specify the number of workers that can run them and then just execute them. The most impressive thing here is probably that this library is just 1.6 kilobytes and has zero dependencies, which is kind of awesome. And it's also quite easy to use. Uh, you literally just push the tasks into array and then just uh, tell a runner to run tasks from the array and that's it, which is, which is basically great. So if you are looking for something like this, do check it out, it seems to be quite nice. Next library we got here is pampy.js, pattern matching for JavaScript. 
Now there's been a bunch of libraries that did pattern matching. And I mean, we still have the pattern matching proposal coming to JavaScript, which I hope relatively soon, because I really like the pattern matching uh, thingy in other languages. And I hope the JavaScript guys will nail it as well, because it can save you a lot of code. But uh, for now, you can use pattern matching libraries. And there's a lot of them, they all have different approaches. But uh, this one seems actually quite nice. So this is one of the cleaner syntaxes that I've seen so far, I think. So there's a bunch of examples here for like Fibonacci, uh, line calculations, and this buzz and whatever. And yeah, it's, it's quite nice. So if you never use pattern matching, do check it out. If you know pattern matching, then I guess check it out as well. It's, it's quite nice. Have you tried Google Christmas Day? No, I haven't. We can do that at the very end of the stream. Remind me when, I, when I'm done with um, libraries and demos then. All right. Next thing we got here is React storage hooks. React hooks for state sync with local storage and session storage. Now, uh, this is a really neat library, not just, you know, because it, um, so the idea is very simple. You got the React hooks that store state in the local storage or session storage, right? So you get two hooks. And the cool thing is that the state is actually synchronized between the tabs. So if you have the same app opened in two tabs and you use those hooks to change the state in one tab, it will use the storage, uh, what was it? Storage sync API or whatever, storage events, right? This is how they called storage events to synchronize the state between the tabs automatically, which is really awesome. So um, yeah, quite excited to see more hooks like this. If you are in need of something like this, do check it out. It essentially, it does all the heavy lifting for you and it's just one kilobyte gzipped, which is even more awesome. So do check it out. Next thing we are here is Headless DevTools, uh, the library that lets you perform Chrome DevTools actions from code by leveraging Chrome, uh, Headless Chrome and Puppeteer. Uh, I mean, you could do all of this stuff with Puppeteer directly, but it was a bit of a pain because I had to do it manually, but uh, this library essentially wraps it for you in a nice function call. So for example, you can get unused CSS percentage from the dev tools by just uh, running the calc and use CSS function on your page and uh, get the callback for that basically. Uh, you know, so you can provide the interactions which uh, would actually measure the percentage better, right? And as as well, like take heap snapshots. And I guess it could be extended to do just about anything which is Quite nice abstraction instead of, you know, doing all of that manually. So do check it out if you want something like this. Next thing we got here is extract date. It's a data extraction from an arbitrary text input, and it understands a bunch of uh, different formats going from the, you know, simplest ones like this to the words, to the verbal, to I think mostly uh, English language stuff like yesterday, today, tomorrow, Monday, Tuesday. Uh, I guess it could be localized at some point, but uh, anyway, it looks pretty nice. So if you need to extract dates from text, do check it out. Uh, seems to be working relatively well. Next thing we got here is the package from site called arg, and it's a simple argument parsing. It's um, yet another command line option parser, it says. And uh, yeah, it's, it's just a argument parser from site. I'm like, I, it parses arguments. That's, that's basically all I have to do. There's nothing super complex about it. But I'm guessing it's small and efficient because the side guys, they always do this kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, but we can we can actually check it bundle phobia. And uh, let's see ARG. This is yeah, 77 uh, bytes minified and gzipped, which is super tiny. Next package we got here is MRI or MRI. I'm not sure exactly how to read that. Uh, it's a also a quick scan for command line flags and arguments from uh, Mr. Luke Edwards, who is a fan of super tiny and super fast um, packages. And this one actually has benchmarks that compare it to the minimist nopts and yargs parser. And it is, well, yeah, as you can see here, like a lot faster, like about six times than the minimist, about 100, no, there's even more than 100 times, like a lot more faster basically than just about anything else available in the market. <laughs> which is kind of great. So if you're looking for a really fast arguments parsing, do check it out. Next thing we got here is Prime, open source GraphQL CMS. Uh, this is exactly what it says. Uh, all in one content management system built on top of GraphQL also seems to come with a bunch of uh, UI bits. So if you were looking for something like this, do check it out written in TypeScript. And um, yeah, this is basically 
seems to be quite nice. I mean, maybe you need it. So check it out. All right, that's it for the libraries and demos this time around. I actually have another demo that I wanna show you, but we're gonna be doing it at the very end. But before that, let's talk about other cool things uh, that have been announced this time around. So first one I wanna point out is the Windows Sandbox. So this is something that Windows 10 will include starting the next build for now is just available in the insider build. And it's a really cool thing based on the Hyper V containers in Windows that allows you to run a Windows Sandbox. So you literally can start another in the instance of Windows that will have a virtualized environment that is very low overhead. And you can do whatever you want in there. And once you close it, it will destroy the whole environment. Which means that you can do stuff like malware testing on running on safe code or experimenting with stuff and seeing what kind of changes does the things, you know, do to your system to just close it and, and wipe everything. There is a bit of more technical detail in here on how it works. You can also link a host file system uh, to it if you uh, want to. And it is kind of awesome and it's baked into the windows itself. So it's, it's kind of great to be honest. Quite excited to see this land in the stable version. All right, and the next thing, uh, this is, yes, checking if it's infected with the virus works too. The question is, you know, like Hyper-V is quite stable, but um, I would still take additional precautions. <laughs> Maybe because I'm paranoid. But okay, uh, so the next thing here is a very funny thing from uh, Mr. Aaron Hansen, who is also known as Agoraptor. He actually found out that if you have too many tabs open in Chrome on mobile, it changes your tab count into a smiley face, which is quite amusing. So I, I've, being a person who never opens too many tabs, this is kind of uh, very funny and I, I don't think I've ever seen that, but uh, it's just, just kind of cool, neat little trick. Okay, and to close this all, I just want to show you this very awesome demo that is called Sandspiel and it's... Um, Sandbox game written in Rust and WebAssembly that allows you to play with elements. So you have this panel on the right side, which allows you to pick a bunch of stuff, including like, you know, stone, for example, ice, um, gas, and my favorite ones. So we're gonna, we're gonna set off some fireworks. So I'm gonna put some fireworks over here, right? And I'm gonna just fire it up, just a, just a bit. And no, what? I think it just burned. <laughs> Something didn't work out. Uh, can you just reset that? There we go. Yes, please. So we, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna put some fireworks, right? And I, I spent like half an hour playing with this thing last time. So uh, if I'm spacing out a bit, this is why. Then we just put some lava on top of it. And there you go, we got some fireworks. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of elements and all of them work and it is incredibly fun to play with them and it's very silly and uh, It's just awesome and the source code is available on github so you can check it out uh, Right, so Google Christmas Day. I have not tried that yet and there is no wait google.com Let's see. Why is there? I don't what is Google Google Christmas Day? What is that? Google Christmas Day uh, Google Santa Tracker. Is that what you're talking about? Or is it something different? Santa Tracker, play. Help Tensor practice its image recognition. I am answering CAPTCHA every time. Uh, draw candy cane. Oh, they, I'm terrible at drawing. There you go. That's a candy cane, right? It's not a snorkel. What are you? It's not a saxophone. Oh, no. <laughs> What the? Uh, right, no, no, I'm not gonna continue doing that. Okay. When I Google just for Christmas day. Okay, Christmas day. That might be like a hidden, oh yeah, there you go. Okay. Um, that doesn't seem to be interactive though, but it looks nice. Uh, <laughs> Maybe it's just too early for Germany to celebrate Christmas, you know? Has to be strictly on 24th. All right, guys, that's basically it. That's all I have for today. Uh, yeah, that's a tiny, teeny Christmas BXJS weekly. Uh, if you have anything else, feel free to throw it into the chat. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them. If not, then uh, we can basically wrap it up and go enjoy our weekend, Christmas and other holidays. 
Um, as I said before, uh, first of all, you can find all the links as usual mentioned uh, on the GitHub. Uh, the link, link is in the description. Uh, you can join our Discord server if you just want to chat about JavaScript or if you need help. There is a bunch of people who will gladly help you there. Um, as I mentioned before, we're going to have a Christmas stream uh, likely at some point later on. I'm not sure exactly when it's going to happen because we suddenly have a ton of guests with, visiting us. So I'll just have to find some time for that. If Christmas stream won't happen, we're definitely going to have a New Year's stream because I have my birthday on 1st of January and I want to do some giveaways. So, yeah, that's that's basically it. So, seems like no more questions, no more suggestions. So, thank you guys very much for watching. Thank you for your continued support. Have an awesome weekend and uh, Merry Christmas to all you celebrating and Happy Holidays uh, to everyone else. And uh, I guess... Either I see you after Christmas or I see you in the new year. We're going to see how that all works out. Keep an eye on the Discord uh, where I announce all of that stuff. And yeah, go enjoy yourself. Bye.